Hey traders, charting man Dan of the chart guys checking in on the charts and our major sectors. Bears coming out swinging yet again today. We've seen a pattern where we're not really getting, you know, big gap down opens or, or notable fear overnight. We're seeing a pattern where we trend up overnight. The closer we get to the open, we start to pull back on the futures chart. And then we end up with bears controlling once the bell rings. And just an example of that, this morning we had the NASDAQ and shout out to AM who pointed this out. But the NASDAQ had a really nice rising wedge right into resistance on the morning. So here is the NASDAQ resistance overnight. That's that's the high of pre-market, the high of the end of the day bounce yesterday, the high of pre-market, and then this bounce grinding up for hours was a rising wedge. How do we know it's a rising wedge? Because the bull breaks lack follow through. And when you have a bearish reversal pattern heading into a key resistance level that you can then top fish that's when you gain confidence because it's a confluence of signals. You're getting multiple signals. So we ended up with a double top at the high of pre-market. The rising wedge breaks bare into the open and then a big bull move up. In this market, you will often find fast hard moves in one direction with zero follow through. And in the bear market, it's been bull moves up with zero follow through. If you remember the bull market, we would often see the bell ring, we would drop in the first 20 minutes and bulls would buy that dip every time and we would just recover all morning. And that was a gimme trade. You have to change the trends. You hear me talking about trends ad nauseum all the time in these videos and why they are so important. If you just shoot straight up, it's a nice flashy big move. If you do not change trends and prove follow through, you can give that move back. QQQ from the low of the day shot up 1% plus, didn't confirm a one minute uptrend, didn't confirm a two minute uptrend, a five minute uptrend, nothing. And we ended up giving back the entire move. So as soon as you see that happen, aggressive bears have a one minute stair step that they can then play off of. And if you don't know what a stair step is, Google chart guys stair step, there's a whole video going over it. But the signal here was 265 breaking you short. My style has me exiting half at, you know, one minute EMA, I would exit half or when I can get risk free. If I'm in at 265 and I can exit half at 264.50 and stick my stop at 265.50 and then let it play out, I am then not stopped out the entire move. The same thing happened on this big bounce midday out of nowhere. QQQ, which has been all bears, no sign of bulls whatsoever the entire day, aside from the first few minutes, we just go straight up. It's a, a mini short squeeze. Short squeeze is probably the wrong word, but there's definitely shorts covering and some pressure being put on. We didn't even confirm the five minute uptrend. We just went straight up for 1% with no five minute uptrend confirming. And that stair step pattern breaking bearish then gives another great entry. And in my trade review that I'm going to do at the end of this video, that was my mistake. I was a little bit too early on that short. Waiting for the stair step patterns is ideal. When you are trading with the trend, the longer term time frame trend, you do not establish support on the way up. You do not confirm the trend changes. You look for the stair step breaking to make that entry. And then you have a level to play off of. So we'll get to that trade review in just a bit. S&P 500 heading back down to the low spy low of last week, 374.77 in play. You can look at you know, spy two ways. You can look at it and say, bulls are holding on really well considering what the NASDAQ and big tech names have done and Tesla over the last few weeks or the last week plus. You could also look at this and say, Tesla's getting ready to roll over and join NASDAQ weakness and the fear hasn't even started yet in the broader market, the S&P 500. And we'll see which one remains true XLV and XLF are the keys for me, as I keep saying, and I'll talk about it again. But for now, clear bear control day. Look at this triple top on SPY. 383.06, 383.15, 383.39. So breaking resistance by a few pennies every time, but obviously no follow through. And the lack of follow through comes from QQQ not participating. QQQ is all bears over the last four days. Another clue this morning to not trust the bull move first thing is I was looking at QQQ up 0.5% and I'm looking at all of our major generals, Apple, Amazon, Microsoft, Meta, Google. I'm watching them all and I'm seeing nobody 
is standing up and saying, I'm the leader of Team Bull for QQQ. Nobody was standing out strong. Every single name that I just mentioned was up less than half a percent. They were all up less than what QQQ was up. If QQQ is going to see any kind of move up, we have to see some of the major players like Apple or Amazon leading the way. And my analogy this morning when I was live streaming was, it's just a leaderless army. You know, QQQ is ready to go. There's nobody leading the way from our major core names. And so there's no confidence. And then the move fades and we give it all back. So here we are testing 258.46. And then it's just the fear low, 253.65. Again, as I've mentioned recently, there is a possibility where we break the fear low with no follow through. And that has SPY set a higher low compared to the fear low. That's something I'm watching for in the first week or two of January here, but just taking it one day at a time and knowing that if the QQQ bulls are not proving a thing, it means stay bearish. And so I took a little bit more of my SQQQ position that I talked about in the video yesterday that I was swinging. I took some of that off at the end of the day today, just because the NASDAQ futures chart, the 12 hour RSI is currently at 28. And if we go back and look here, I can see we bounced off 29, 28, 27, 28, 29, 27, you get the idea, 28. So we've got six or seven examples where we've bounced from this range. One time we dipped much lower this year and that, that covers the entire year. So this year, the 12 hour RSI got down to 20 at its most extreme, but every single other time, the, the, the last seven times we've gotten here, we've bounced from this range. So that's just enough for me to say, okay, bears a bad pull control for a couple days, taking some profit into the strength and doesn't mean we can't go lower tomorrow, but just taking a bit more off the table. I also entered some metal short positions, which I'll talk about in a moment as well. So pretty much just exchanging some SQQQ for some metal shorts because the dollar is testing resistance. Dollar must break 104.60. We confirmed an hourly bull flag. We're testing 104.60 right now. If we reject, we remain range bound. If we break it, we have to ensure that we break 104.93 for follow through, but that would be the first close. If we break and close above daily EMA 12 for the first time in almost two months, that will be notable to us. And again, that's the premise, one of the premises, premises for my metals short that I just opened. And I, I'm starting with some smaller positions, just feeling it out because the dollar hasn't broken bull yet. And I will add to those positions if I continue to get the signals that I'm looking for. But the main signal is the dollar must break bull, which it hasn't done yet. That's another point in favor of the broader market bears saying, you know, the dollar isn't doing anything to help the market drop in terms of the inverse relationship. And if the dollar breaks bull here and starts a weekly bounce, then that has potential to put further downward pressure on markets. Tesla with a great volatile trading day today, highest volume of the entire drop and a very small candle. So that's a, a huge amount of volume condensed in a very small range. And essentially what I'm watching now is obviously supply of shares has been outweighing demand for weeks at this point. And today is the scales doing this and we balanced out today. And so tomorrow is going to show us do the scales then flip to demand outweighing supply? And demand, of course, covers shorts needing to cover and longs looking to buy the dip. And so we ended the day with an hourly equilibrium where we've got our high of the day, low of the day, lower high and higher low, and just really nice signals and follow through in both directions. Did a little bit of flipping today, but it's the kind of thing where you see this move up and you say, okay, Tesla bulls, if we don't break the high of the day, it is just an hourly lower high. So I keep that in the back of my mind and say, all right, bulls are looking good. QQQ is looking extremely weak. Obviously QQQ did nothing to help the Tesla bulls today. So what would be an indication that an hourly lower high is forming? A loss of the five minute uptrend. That means we zoom in and look for bearish patterns on the short term timeframes. And it was a beautiful head and shoulders. And again, easy in hindsight, but posted in advance. Oops. So as this is forming at 231, which puts us right 
here. So right here, the post is Tesla still watching for that potential hourly lower high versus the high of the day. The bears have to confirm a five minute downtrend from here. There's a five minute head and shoulders. This five minute head and shoulders would have to play out. And then in the thread, I post the chart, but the chart was that. So again, just laying it out in advance. This is what it would need to look like if this is going to be a head and shoulders when I make that post. And then we see a bounce off support to the penny. There's our right shoulder. There's our five minute lower high. And then we break bear. And you look at that and say, so what? But it gives enough of an opportunity for, you know, a 1% drop, which is worthwhile as a bear. And that's the kind of move where, you know, if you're entering bearish there, then you want to take partial position into the, the pattern confirming and try and let it play out in case we dump into the end of the day and then probably would have stopped out into the close. So not a very notable move, but again, that's the, the setup of how we need to be using these different time frames in relation to each other and out in different patterns. So five minute head and shoulders, scouting an hourly lower high and a nice tightening range into tomorrow. I'm also watching the Tesla divided by QQQ chart where we've got the relative strength is trying to shift here. It's a double, look at, look at the tops here. We double topped at the high of the day. And again, if this chart is going up, it shows me that Tesla is stronger than the NASDAQ. We double topped and rejected. And now the bulls are attempting this little cup and handle pattern. And if that were to confirm, that's a good sign for the bulls that Tesla's gonna get some daily bounce follow through. And of course, Tesla's got to break the high of today, tomorrow, 116.27 to get that bounce underway. Next level would be 119.67 and then a small gap fill at 121.02. And we'll be watching daily EMA 12 as a target that's going to continually drop rapidly due to the recent rapid drop in price. So that's one indication that we're looking for to give us confidence in a Tesla bounce. Netflix do, is doing potentially the opposite. So Netflix daily chart is good for the bears. Daily bear flag confirming, daily downtrend confirming for the first time in a while. Again, I've been talking about this setup for a long time, ever since we were looking at this as a rising wedge back here. And so one thing that is that the, obviously the bears liked today's trading with that follow through. But one thing that the bears have to be cautious of is Netflix divided by QQQ. Again, this correlation chart, it's holding support here. So if we were to bounce from here, and if I'm a Netflix bear, that's a little bit of a red flag. That shows me that the bears couldn't drive it home and take out that support to show relative weakness. And again, Netflix broke a lower low, the correlation did not. So you need to see that correlation following suit. Just like NVDA divided by QQQ fell apart over the last three days, not today, but the prior three days, Netflix divided by QQQ needs to see that happening because if we hold this support here and end up eventually breaking bull, that's going to show us that Netflix, you know, remains one of the lead bulls. So the bears have to prove to us that this lead bull is turning into a lead bear by breaking that 104 level. Man, this video could be 40 minutes long. I'm cutting out things I want to say. So now what? Semiconductors, SMH, still weak. Lower highs and lower lows. NVDA slowed down the momentum. We started weak, but NVDA then traded sideways for the entire day with a really nice equilibrium while QQQ did nothing but drop further. So that shows us bare exhaustion on NVDA, at least in the short term. And again, it's the scale's just balancing. The last three days, supply of shares significantly outweighed demand, where really on Friday it did, Thursday, Thursday, supply is outweighing demand. Friday, we're trying to balance it out a little bit. So the scales get even, but they stay flipped with supply significantly outweighing demand. And now again, the scales are trying to level out and they have to flip with the bulls confirming hourly uptrend and getting a daily bounce underway. We know we're gonna be scouting a daily lower high to be the result of the next bounce in NVDA. Semiconductors, and NVDA, they've got a lot of space for a weekly higher low compared to the fear low. That fear low is not in play. So again, we're still leaving the door open for the possibility of an inverse head and shoulders, but 
we would need to see a drastic shift in the first couple of weeks of 2023 if that's going to remain a possibility. If you are looking bearish in the start of 2023 for things to get ugly, you want these charts to roll over, XLF and XLV. And XLV did a good thing for the bears today. We broke resistance, the highest level in over a week, straight into a close at the low of the day. And if we roll over and break 133.71 and confirm the daily downtrend, then SPY is gonna start catching up to, to the NASDAQ weakness from the last couple of weeks. And XLF is the same thing. Failing resistance, still holding on. We're still within striking distance of resistance. But if we fail it and break 33.19, it's a big win for the bears. I talked in the video yesterday about the number, the, the, the main things that I'm watching for the bears checklist this week. Apple breaking fear lows is absolutely one of the notable events for the bears. And it was a really nice follow through. We break 128.65 and we drop by $2 very quickly. More than that. I mean, it's a 2% drop right off the bat from that level breaking. Apple now has a big bear bullseye on its forehead. And if you're looking around Twitter, you see everybody, you know, doing the comparison charts of what Apple, how, how Apple was similar to Tesla. And now it's entering a bit of free fall. Just the fact that we're at fresh fear lows. And you look at Tesla and people are saying, oh, you know, you break that level and then we free fall. I'm not saying Apple's going to drop like Tesla has, but it's got a target. It was one of the last major generals to roll over. Amazon rolled over long ago. We know Meta, Netflix, they rolled over long ago. Apple is now rolling over. Big confidence booster for bears, as long as this is in a daily downtrend. We are quickly in daily oversold conditions, but while we haven't been oversold, Look at that dip buying. We've only just kissed daily oversold every single time in the last two and a half years. If bears want to make a statement, drop for another couple of days, get that daily RSI to the lowest level it's seen in two and a half years. That would be notable follow through. Otherwise, if we start a daily bounce from here, it's going to be a bear break without much follow through. But anyway, you cut it. A good day for the, the tech sector bears now that Apple is joining the bear party. IWM at fresh consolidation lows. The fear lows are still a ways away at 161.75, but no sign of a weekly higher low compared to that level at this point. XBI, bears lacking follow through. Today was a day for the bears to drive it home. And again, that we're leveling out in an equilibrium, trading sideways while the market was red today. And so have to be cautious of the potential that we do see this downtrending support line hold from here. That would be disappointing for me just because finally getting clarity on XBI. But if we start, you know, if this hourly equilibrium breaks bull, then it's, we're going to scout a daily lower high, but then it's right back to choppy action. Bear break, no follow through. So the metals, I'm scouting the metals bearish as I've been mentioning for a very long time, well, a week plus because of this rising wedge and because I'm looking for the dollar to break bull sooner rather than later on the daily chart. And so I grabbed some initial positions today. And the reason for grabbing positions is almost to ensure myself, okay, you're now gonna watch this very closely because if I'm not in any metals positions, I look at the metals when I first wake up, and I'll check in on them maybe once during the day. But if I'm in open positions, then I'm gonna be checking in on them 10 times during the day. And that's gonna help me stay on top of things and potentially add to my position. And if gold breaks daily support of 1784, that would be an indication that would have me adding. If silver were to break daily support of 2338, that would have me looking to add. So I added today and silver is doing great. Silver is doing exactly what I wanted it to from my entry today, staying weak, although this is a falling wedge. I don't like that. That's a falling wedge. Have to see that break bear. I don't know where my resistance line would be, but the support line is certainly valid. So have to see that break bear by falling through 23 38 support to lose the daily uptrend to have me looking to add. And again, we're just going to look for a weekly high or low. I'm only targeting weekly EMA 12, at least initially, on a pullback. 
but I am now much more actively watching for that. So silver doing what I wanted it to, gold held on better, which is unusual. So I'm hoping that silver sells off harder because we know silver goes up faster on bull moves and silver pulls back harder on the bear moves. XAU, XAG, definitely having a green day today. First time I'm looking at it, but this is showing us. I drew, I don't know when I drew that, but I'd say it's still in play. But it's showing us a bit of a, a, an attempt to shift the relative strength and weakness between gold and silver. And so if silver drops harder than gold on weekly consolidation, this chart's going to break bull. But anyways, that's what I'm looking at. So just a little starter. I need more proof. But I'm watching very closely now. Miners, weekday today, still holding a higher low on the daily, but a double top. We double topped into daily consolidation. So now it's just a question of, does that consolidation follow through to take out some support levels and shape up weekly consolidation? Oil, daily consolidation underway. No red flags at this point. Bulls ideally want to hold EMA 12 to keep it a bull flag here to try and see continuation. If we get another red day, then we'll start to be creating some potential space for a daily lower high to be the result of the next bounce. But for now, no red flags. Bulls want to regain that four-hour uptrend. The sooner, the better. And that's energy had a big red day today after a green day yesterday. Aggressive energy bears are watching for this weekly lower high. I would need to see weakness on oil. And there is headline risk of China reopening. That's bullish for oil and energy. But let's see, what would oil need to do? I mean, oil could set a weekly lower high, anything under 83.27. If that were to happen, then XLE bears would get that weekly lower high. But oil not weak enough just yet. And natural gas we know is all bear. Daily bear flag confirmed. Four hour trend change attempt from the video yesterday failed. Unable to break resistance. Rolling over. Lowest level in a long time. Last time we were at these levels, nine months ago. So bears now have the trend in their favor on all time frames for natural gas. Monthly, weekly, daily, four-hour downtrend. Hourly oversold bounce, but watching those four-hour lower highs. So that's where we stand overall. Another win for the bears. Can't have confidence in the broader market bulls if the NASDAQ is dropping, if Apple is at fresh fear lows with no sign of nearby support, if Amazon, Amazon hit a new fear low, I believe, today. Yep. So Amazon's technically a falling knife. It's not a Tesla style of falling knife, but it's clear downtrend with no nearby support levels and no attempt at shifting this structure back to the bulls. As long as Amazon and Apple... Huh? So we're paying attention to that. Again, no sign it's holding, but one, two, three, four touches. And here we are again. But again, that's not something I would act on as a bull. That's something if I have a bearish position, maybe I'm keeping an eye on it. But again, can't be bullish if QQQ just drops every day as a lead bear. Spy divided by QQQ, or let's go QQQ divided by spy. It just is, it's, it's in free fall, which is showing us this is the, I mean, this is the weakest stretch, this two week stretch. And you can, it's probably tax loss selling related, but this two week stretch is the weakest. It's the most significant weakness of QQQ comparative to SPY that we've seen in months. And it's because XLV and XLF are holding up and QQQ is in free fall. And so again, we are now at the weakest level that we have been in almost three years, nope, two years of the NASDAQ compared to the S&P 500. All right, do good things. Hope you are well, see you tomorrow. I forgot the QQQ trade review. So essentially what it was is just scaling in too early and then having that still being right on the bigger picture of what's going on, but the psychology of the mindset shifts. So if I scale in, a position and then a second position. And then I had my stop if 262.80 broke. And so I stop out 
and I recognize that's probably the high of the bounce where I just stopped out. And because I stopped out and it wasn't a day loser, if that was a day loser at that point, I, I don't re-enter that trade because again, the last thing I wanna do is compound losses and let it run away from me. But I re-entered and because at that point I was trying to salvage mistakes, I didn't let the trade play out. Whereas if my timing was better, I then, you know, I exit half into the initial pullback or whatever position size, and then I let the rest of the trade play out from there for the day. And so you'll you'll note, I'm sure many people are the same way, where it's almost like rather than letting the bigger picture move play out, it was, all right, I just ate a loss. I got a good entry now on my second attempt, but I'm just looking to make back that loss. And I'm just trying to salvage the trade and then move on from there. And then you know, forget about it and on to the next one. So I do that fairly often when I am too early on a move. And that is something that I'm trying to improve upon. And so just wanted to highlight that psychologically. And the lesson is stair step. You know, I wouldn't have been too early if I wait for the stair step, if I short on the break of 262.41 and my stop then goes over the high at that point, I'm risking 60 cents. And the reward is obviously much more than that. So as, as I go to futures, that's gonna have to be ingrained into my brain because I'm not gonna scale in on futures because there is more risk than doing that with common shares. And so I have to always have a level to be playing off of if I am entering a futures trade, which again, I'm gonna be doing in 2023. So I'm gonna be using stair steps and levels already established a lot more and then playing off of those levels versus scaling in to try and get you know the ideal entry up near the top. So that's the takeaway of what ended up being a break-even trade essentially, but money left on the table. So chapter six of the adventure, we had headed west, we hit Boulder and I was staying with that woman, got the house sitting gig for a month. And I actually did trade a bit when I had that house sitting gig because I had stable internet and I had a routine and I could be more focused on it. So I was still trading penny stocks at that point. This was maybe five, six years ago. And I had a couple weeks until I started house sitting. So I explored Colorado. That's the kind of green you want to see. Tons of places to camp, tons of things to see. Utah and Colorado is a great chunk of land. And I haven't explored northern Utah. I wanted to. I had a road trip that was planned through northern Utah, through the northwest part of the country. I'm going to have to put that on my next to-do list later this summer. First, I'm going to be going back to Colorado in May. So I will bring my camera. All these pictures are with my phone but I'll bring my camera and I'm going to explore a bit more of Colorado and see some shows at the Red Rocks and have some fun, but that's for another time. So this time around, plenty of places to camp. My favorite part about Colorado is that there are rivers, so many places coming off of mountains. And so that made two things very easy. Number one, getting the fresh water and uh, filtering it to drink. And then number two, being able to have things. You don't want to be, you know, have a cooler and have food that needs to be kept cool when you're road tripping across the country. It's just constantly needing ice and then those plastic bags. And it's just when you have ice cold water coming off the mountain, I would just pull over and fill up my cooler with cold water and then put stuff that needed refrigeration in it. And then, you know, 12 hours later, 20 hours later, I can just dump that water out and refill it with other cold water. So the water in, in Colorado is not for swimming. You can jump in and enjoy it for a brief amount of time, but it is very cold coming off of those mountains, especially in May and June. And I believe it was June now, heading towards July. But tons of great places to camp and lots of solitude. My favorite part about getting to a place that was a couple miles into the trail and had a nice clearing like this where you know it's just a lake and, and the forest is knowing that at about 4 or 5 p.m., no new people are going to be getting up to that spot. And that's because you can't hike up there and have enough time to get back before it's getting dark. So there's this, this lull time before it gets dark where everybody is stops coming up. And so you have it to yourself during that dusk time when the sun's going down. This is the baby elk that I snuck up on. And again, it's just, just being still and very slowly moving. It's just a game of you know, watching animals and trying to get close to them. There were no mothers or fathers around, which was good. <laughs> so there's plenty of spots like this all over. And I can't stress enough how if you go to freecampingsites.net, 
and you look at BLM land, and BLM land is the same as national forest land to a certain degree. It's government owned. There's very little regulation on camping in terms of where you can camp. And it's just this big public lands that we have, you know, to take advantage of. This, I believe, is getting towards Rocky Mountain National Park, one of the spots near the entrance. These are marmots, so pretty much a giant squirrel, if I had to describe them, somewhat like a raccoon. But they would live under the rocks, and you could tell what rocks they lived under because the rim around it was all bright green and lush, and the grass, you know, immediately after the rocks was a little bit dry and arid. And that's because of their waste. They just pop out of their hole and they go to the bathroom and that, you know, fertilizes all the plants that are around their rock. So you can tell where they live and they were curious and friendly. If you pee on a rock, they really enjoy the salt and the water and they'll run and lick it up. And they, they, their lives, I mean, they just live in areas like this where they, that's all they know. That's their life. They sit on their rock and they overlook the expanse. There would be times where I would be alone in a spot and I would sit there and a marmot would jump up on his rock and he'd just be observing everything with me and just hanging out in the dusk. And they get curious if you don't move. So if I sat there for an hour, he might you know, get used to my presence and come and check me out and see what's going on once he realizes that I'm not a threat. So that's the start of Colorado. We'll continue going westward over the Rocky Mountain National Park. Looking forward to going back there again in May and open to any suggestions of places. I'm probably going to hit up Telluride, Steamboat Springs, and Rocky Mountain National Park, Boulder. I'm going to see Papadocio in Red Rocks. I got a buddy in that band. And Random Rab and Polish Ambassador opening up. So that should be a fun show. That'll be in a few months, and I'll be sure to bring you all along. So have a great rest of your day, and we'll see you over the weekend.